This is going to be verse by verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to look at how Paul is a true spiritual soldier that is successful for the most part in spiritual warfare. Now, none of us are always completely successful in our spiritual battles. But Paul got as close as anybody. But there was a lot of people saying that Paul was weak and a sissy and his letters were talk so big and bad but in person he was just a little weakling is what these false teachers were saying about Paul so let's look at first or second Corinthians 10 and look at how Paul is a true spiritual soldier all right verse 1 now I Paul myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in presence and base among you but being absent and bold toward you so the Corinthians thought Paul was a little wimp in person. They thought his letters were bold and powerful. And when reading his letters, they thought he would be a big dude, but when he showed up, he was just a little dude. His presence was base among them. So the Corinthians thought he talked big and bad in his letters They and that he couldn't confront them face to face. But we know Paul is a spiritual soldier because he didn't live for the flesh. In 2 Corinthians 10.2, it says, But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think it to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to this flesh. Paul is beseeching them. He is urging them to get right before he comes so that he doesn't have to be bold towards them when he is present. And he says in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war after the flesh. Even though Paul is even though Paul isn't absent from the body, he's still walking around in the flesh. His war isn't after the flesh. He isn't going to use physical weapons in a spiritual war. He isn't going to war after the flesh when he gets to the Corinthians. His bodily presence might not be much to look at. He may not be able to war after the flesh like a Joshua and David. His war is fought with words, you see. That's why he's not going to war after the flesh. So Paul says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Every person alive is still in the flesh. And sometimes when a Christian sins or gets backslid, we might say he's in the flesh. What we mean by that is, he is letting his flesh run things instead of walking in the Spirit. And Paul mentions walking according to the flesh in verse 2, which is something Paul didn't do. He tells us we need to walk in the Spirit. Spiritually speaking, no Christian is in the flesh. Romans 8, 8, 9 says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh. But in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So the Christian still has the option to choose to live for God or to live for the flesh. His choice has nothing to do with his salvation. The choice has to do with his discipleship. He can choose to live for the flesh or he can choose to live for God. There is a consequence to walking according to the flesh. And Paul was a man who walked according to the Spirit like a true spiritual soldier. Most men are so weak that they walk according to the flesh. And Romans 8.13 says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And then Paul goes on to say, As a good spiritual soldier, in verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So Paul lets us know that we have a spiritual sword. And this isn't a physical sword like that of David's mighty men, because we don't war after the flesh. Now we get spiritual application from those epic physical fights in the Old Testament, but when it comes to spreading the gospel, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The definition of carnal is pertaining to the flesh, so the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. So Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, and Paul is a spiritual soldier with a spiritual sword. And he talks about it in Ephesians 6.12 where he says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places.
And he says in Ephesians 6, 17, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So it's a spiritual sword. And that's why the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, as it says in verse 4. So we know that Paul is a spiritual soldier because he doesn't walk according to the flesh. He doesn't war after the flesh. And we know Paul is a spiritual soldier because he has a handle on his thought life, which can be a stronghold. As it says in verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Imaginations are strongholds. A man's thoughts can be the death of him. The act of a wicked sin starts with a long process of wicked thinking. Uh, the kids' movies say, use your imagination, but most times your imagination is a bad thing. Genesis 6, 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So Paul says, bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every thought you think should praise the Lord. And here is a list that you can use to test your thoughts. Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. So if the thought isn't one of these things, then you should probably start thinking about someone, about something else. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5 Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every high thing can be taken care of if you bring it to the Lord. In the Old Testament, they had high places where they worshipped their idols and Satan said, I will be like the Most High. Every high thing is anything in the world that someone might be trying to exalt over God and His Word. And Paul is a spiritual soldier because... <clears throat> He had control, not complete control, but he had good control of his thought life. That is part of spiritual warfare, casting down imaginations, which is a stronghold. And next, Paul is a spiritual soldier because he got revenge on past sins. 2 Corinthians 10, 6, and have, having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. When I got saved and found out how to live right... I wanted to get revenge on all disobedience that I had done. That is why many times you see me attack the music artists, the movies, the TV shows, and all that stuff. I want revenge on the stuff that was leading me and others to hell. I have a readiness to attack, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't use violence. We use the words of God. It's sharper than any man-made sword anyway. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's a spiritual sword. And Paul used his spiritual sword against false religion because he was getting revenge on what was putting him towards the road to hell before he was saved. He profited in the Jews' religion, and he was getting his revenge on that, preaching salvation by grace through faith. Now, verse 7 in chapter 10, Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust himself that he is Christ, let him himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. So do you look on things after the outward appearance? Uh, that's what Paul did back when he was in his false religion. The Pharisees looked on things at tradi of tradition and after the flesh. But if a preacher doesn't have today, if a preacher doesn't have on a suit and tie, do you assume he is a compromiser and just sh shut him off? Uh, many preachers will do that today. And I admit most preachers that you see wearing street clothes also use modern Bibles and stuff like that. But I also do know preachers who are King James Bible believers and have some of the greatest minds of anyone alive right now when it comes to the Bible. Uh, I never see Bob Alexander wearing a suit and tie. If I look on things after the outward appearance, I would have said, well, where is his suit and tie? I would have turned him off and missed a blessing. But most of Christians look for on the outward appearance are personal convictions at best. Wearing a suit and tie is a personal 
conviction and a tradition. For anyone to say that someone without a shirt and tie is a compromiser, that's completely being a Pharisee. There are some guys who would rather hear a preacher preach out of the NIV if he's wearing a suit and tie than to hear a Bible believer preach with a hoodie on. And that's just the way it is. That's how they are. They look on the outward appearance. I care about the truth that comes out of a man's mouth, not the clothes that he has on. As long as a person has on modest clothes, not showing their nakedness, nothing filthy written on it, then it's fine and you really can't find any sin in what they have on. If you do, then you're trying to push your own personal convictions on somebody else. The Corinthians were looking at Paul's outward appearance. And Paul probably had rusty-looking clothes, a frail little body, a short little guy who had been beat and everything else. Sometimes people who don't look saved are actually born-again believers. I mean, Joe Biden looks like a well-to-do man, yet he's one sick puppy. And I know born-again believers that have tattoos of spider webs on their hands and fingers and sometimes a man will carry the scars over into his saved life that he got on the way of being a transgressor now verse 8 for that though i should boast somewhat more of our authority which the lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction i should not be ashamed so since the corinthians had certain men who crept in to discredit paul paul will now boast somewhat more of his authority. He is going to give them some credentials to show he is really a spiritual soldier in spiritual warfare and a God-called apostle who was raised up by the Lord for the edification of the body of Christ and not for their destruction. And Paul knows it isn't good to brag. And he's not doing it because he thinks he is something, but because the Corinthians may be losing respect for him because of the words of other men. So get this straight, Paul did not think highly of himself. As he said himself in Galatians 6, 3, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Romans seven eighteen says, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So get this straight, Paul did not think highly of himself. In 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. He called himself the chief of sinners. In 2 Corinthians 10.8, it says, For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. So Paul is going to give his credentials and not be ashamed. That's why he says, for though I should boast somewhat more of our authority. And in verse 9 he says, that I, might, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. Talking about these epistles, the letters. Epi an epistle is a letter. Paul isn't just trying to terrify them by letters. He's not sending, sending them little notes in the mail that say, I know what you did last summer. Like the movie where the guy is sending letters to the people terrifying them. It's not like that. 2 Corinthians 10.10 10 says, For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So that's what they were saying about Paul, all these false teachers, and getting a lot of the Corinthians to believe the same things about him. And you see this today where, You'll have a person, they'll get saved under a, a certain man's ministry. Somebody comes along and they say, well, that man is a false teacher. And it turns them away from their spiritual father, their spiritual mentor. And this guy's just trying to draw disciples after himself. He's trying to uh, get somebody else's converts and make them his students. But Paul is a spiritual soldier. He's not like these false teachers are claiming. Paul is a spiritual soldier who relied on the words of God. And that's why his letters were weighty and powerful. And you can see that he quotes the Bible. You could tell that he's read the Old Testament. Paul's letters were powerful. He was bold in the truth. And the truth hits hard. Paul's weapons were not weapons of the flesh. They weren't carnal. Paul may have been one of those guys who, when he preached, uh, 
Uh, when he got up and preached, they would say, I like him all right, but he's more of a teacher. You know how they say that a lot. They say he's not really a preacher. He's more of a teacher. Uh, he says some good stuff, but he kind of bores me because he just kind of just talks in a regular voice and doesn't move around a lot. They said his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Uh, people say Joe Biden is nice and that Trump is mean simply because of how they talk. Uh, men judge how spiritual you are because of how nice you talk or things like that. 2 Corinthians 10, 11. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. So uh, what Paul says in letters is how he will be when he is present. I should be the same in person as you hear me speak on these studies. A teacher, a teacher should talk the same when he teaches as he does in person. But Paul is a spiritual soldier that knew Jesus is the standard, and he's not the standard. A lot of preachers or teachers will, uh, they'll, they'll make themselves the standard. For example, if you're not abstaining from all the same things that they're abstaining from and doing all the same things they're doing, then you're not right with God according to them. But Paul knows he's not the standard and the Lord is the standard. In 2 Corinthians 10, 12, he says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So some commend themselves, according to Paul here. Sometimes a preacher will brag on himself before, for about 15 minutes before he even tells you to open your Bible. Paul wasn't that way. Paul says, when they compare themselves among themselves, that they aren't wise. Sometimes you'll find the most worldly person in your church and compare yourself to that person to make yourself feel better about how bad that you're living. Or uh, people will compare themselves to other Christians and try to compete with that other Christians on who is the most righteous, who's going to be the most righteous. Second Corinthians ten thirteen says, but we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. So Paul isn't going to boast of things without his measure. He isn't going to boast in another man's line of work, but in the measure which God had distributed to him. That's what those false teachers were trying to do. They were trying to get uh, Paul's converts, make them their students, and then they would boast in his line of work. The Corinthians was his line of work. He had converted them. He was the one that was going to help them grow. And these men were just coming in and trying to make Paul look bad. That way they wouldn't listen to him anymore. They would listen to them. There was men coming in, stunning the growth of the Corinthians by placing doubt on Paul. Now verse 14, For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. The Corinthians were not a stretch for Paul. The Corinthians were some of the people that God had given Paul. And there were men coming in and trying to boast in Paul's labors, taking the Corinthians on as if they were their converts and turning them away from Paul, as we've said. But Paul was a spiritual soldier who did right by his other soldiers. In 10:14 through 15, it says, For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reached not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope, when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. Sometimes, a preacher will start up a church up the road from his pastor, from his old pastor, and many of the church members will follow him to that church. He then might boast in his numbers, but then he would be boasting in another man's labors. His former pastors many times who led many of those people to the Lord. Verse 15, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. You don't want to boast in another man's labors. You don't want to take all the credit for souls being saved when a bunch of other men had a hand in it.
And he says in verse 16, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hands. So Paul hopes that their faith will be increased and that they will grow in the faith so that he can have he can give more effort to going into the regions beyond them to preach the gospel. But Paul is a good spiritual soldier who knows who deserves the credit, and it's not him. In verse 17 he says, But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Even though Paul had to commend himself, he still threw in verses like this to show that he knew God gets all the glory. It says in verse 18, For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. So any man can get up and commend himself and brag about himself. For not he that commendeth himself is approved. Does the Lord commend that person? Does the Lord approve that person? Paul's epistles turned out to be in the Holy Bible. The Lord commendeth Paul. That's the evidence that he did. Now the men turning the Corinthians away from Paul have nothing in the Bible. But you see a good portion of the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul showing the Lord approves Paul. That's the Lord commending Paul who is a good spiritual soldier in the Lord. But this has been 2 Corinthians chapter 10.